and welcome to the BNL Eclipse Hour. My name is Aaron Harrell and I'm the media teacher here at the North Lawrence Career Center. And I am Dr. Aaron Miller and I'm the secondary curriculum director for North Lawrence Community Schools. Today we have another great podcast for you about the upcoming total solar eclipse. We have, of course, Mr. Joachim Ladwig, which is our Earth Space Science teacher, NASA partner, and Astronomical Society of the, of the Pacific Eclipse Ambassador. We are also happy to have Dr. Katie Filikowski. She is a distinguished professor at Indiana University Bloomington, where she holds the Daniel Kirkwood Chair in Astronomy and studies the chemical evolution of stars and stellar populations, specifically how the compositions of different populations of stars differ from each other due to different histories of star formation. She especially enjoys sharing the excitement of astronomy with students and the public. She has served as an elected official in numerous astronomical research organizations, including the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. She is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Katie Filikowski is the co-chair of Indiana University's 2023-2024 Solar Eclipse Task Force, leading university-wide efforts to educate and involve students, staff, faculty, and local communities. Welcome, Dr. Katie Filikowski. Well, there you go. Did, was that close enough? That was close, yeah. All right. We tried to mix the serious, stodgy academic with oh, very stodgy. the fun that is Katie Filikowski. <laughs> Let's enjoy this. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> enjoy the blast. Um, I had the privilege, you guys don't know this, but uh, 20 years ago, can you believe, I can't even believe it, <laughs> right? It's we, a long time. We met 20 years ago. I was just a freshman oh. in college. Uh, technically a sophomore, whatever. I did a bunch of class before I came mm -hmm. to, come, to came to IU. It turns out that you had just gotten there the year before me. Indeed. Um, and that was pretty awesome. So had I not, I've never, you and Dr. Durison, <laughs> right? Amazing time. Amazing times. <laughs> the lectures that Dr. Durison gave were, I model my life after that guy. I try to be that big. Nonetheless, Dr. Durison did some pretty crazy stuff. Uh, your, your your lectures were fun, but not crazy. Not crazy. <laughs> so I lean towards crazy as, as much as I can. Uh, here in this uh, podcast series that we're generating here, we are um, trying to have some conversations with a bunch of different people, giving us some different aspects of this whole thing, this mm -hmm. eclipse business that we've got coming upon us here uh, on the eighth of April, two thousand twenty-four. It's coming soon. It's like tomorrow, right? It's in astronomical time. It's yep. right now. Yep. Um, indeed. Um, let me read something here that's pretty entertaining. Uh, this is a podcast where we get a chance to hear different perspectives about solar eclipses from persons who have seriously put their mind to the subject of all things solar eclipse, uh, specifically the total eclipse of the sun occurring in just a few days, essentially the 8th of April, 2024. Um, totality, right, the dark spot, the great hole in the sky, will uh, touch Bedford North Lawrence High School and all of Lawrence County um, at 3.04 p.m. on that Monday. And we're not going to be in school that day, uh, which is what it is, and it's probably a good idea. Yeah? Uh, we'll be in the dark for four minutes, just under four minutes. And you at up at IU will be uh, in the dark for I think, either 20 or 40 seconds longer. I think it's four minutes and two seconds, so not much difference. <laughs> But it, it'll be an eternity for both of us, uh, and that'll be exciting. Uh, and for those at home who are planning to, like, where you're going to be looking, like where you should not sit in your backyard, uh, the actual elevation above the horizon will be 54 degrees, right, at totality. The sun will be 54 degrees above the horizon, and the bearing will be 215 degrees. That's southwest on your compass. So point that way and start doing that today. Like, see where you need to stand, where you need to set your cameras up in your yard, yeah? so that you can film this thing and uh, be ready. You've studied stellar chemistry and stellar evolution throughout your career. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 40 years, three major institutions, yeah? Uh, and, I, and I realize that that's all stars. Um, what actually has drawn you right into the <laughs> eclipse business, like sucked you into the big black hole in the sky? Oh, wow. Well, what sucked me into that? Um, I have a very strong conviction that sharing science is critical for kids and adults and everybody who's interested. It's a way of, of connecting with the world around us and the world far away around us, with the whole universe. Mm. Science, particularly astronomy, is a way of 
understanding things. It's a way of, of seeing a new perspective on nature and people and everything in, in our world. Um, and so I, I deeply feel that sharing science is a critical thing for scientists to do. And because astronomy is such a popular science, it's one that people are just innately curious about. Um, it's, it's part of our mission as, as a scientists and as astronomers to share the excitement that we have. And the eclipse is just about the most exciting thing that will ever happen, mm. any most exciting astronomical thing, I should say, that will ever happen in anyone's life, and almost the most exciting thing ever that will happen in someone's life. A total solar eclipse has been described by many people as life-changing, that it, it connects you to nature, to the world, to the universe, the reality of it, in a way that nothing else does. That powerful moment when the sun disappears in the middle of the day and it gets dark. It's just, it's incredible to see the corona, to see the chromosphere of the sun and to understand the relationships between the bodies of the universe, the sun, the moon, the earth, the stars, the planets will be up, there might be a comet. Mm. It just provides that connection that um, it's hard to feel any other way. So sharing that, making sure people are ready to to enjoy it safely, uh, to understand what they're seeing, to share it with others. That's, a, that's an important moment for everyone. Absolutely. I'm, I get more excited every time I think every about minute. it. Every minute, that's right. That whole everything's connected thing, yeah? It is, right. it is. I'm gonna interrupt, we have our first question from a student uh -huh. here. Uh, we have um, Jay from Mrs. Spring's class of first grader at Shawswick asks, why does a total solar eclipse happen? Oh boy, that's a great question. So the moon orbits around the earth, the earth orbits around the sun, and every now and then the earth, moon, and sun exactly line up in the straight line. If the moon happens to be in between the earth and the sun, the shadow of the moon crosses the earth, and that's what produces an eclipse. And if you're in exactly the right spot, the moon, and the moon is exactly the right size, then it will completely cover the sun and it will get dark. If the moon happens to be on the other side of the earth, far from the sun, so sun, earth, and moon is the lineup, the moon passes in the, in the earth's shadow and that produces a lunar eclipse. The moon gets dark in the night sky. So these eclipses really tell us something about the orientations of the planets and their sizes in space. That's an exciting way to begin to understand the basic layout of our universe. Good question. And that's three questions from my list. So <laughs> nice job, Jay. Way to be there. All right. Um, so we'll get to mechanics. Um, one of my professors taught me a long time ago, they said there's three parts of a science question. There's the what, the so what, and the now what, <laughs> yeah? Uh, and so the what is the mechanics. And you've touched on it a little bit, and I don't know if there's more we should add without uh, having a graphic to talk about, I don't know. I can try if you like. Uh, okay, so how about if I throw out some, some thoughts that came to mind along the way. You mentioned it's got to do with the placement of, of the sun, the earth, and the moon, or the sun and the moon. And, and the, the earth. earth. Right? <laughs> um, we were all down with that. Um, so there's that. Now, every month, the moon passes between the sun and the earth, but that's not an eclipse. Right. You want to know why not? I do. <laughs> and I'd like some numbers, please. Some numbers. Oh, boy. Okay. So when we think about the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun, the sun uh, is in basically the center of our solar system. The Earth orbits around it. It takes 365 and one quarter days mm -hmm. to make a full trip around the sun. And that defines the plane of our Earth's orbit. The moon takes, well, it's a little hard to pin it down, but about 29 days to make one full trip around the Earth in its orbit. But that orbit of the moon around the Earth is tipped at an angle of about five degrees. And so sometimes the moon passes above the Earth and sometimes it passes below the Earth. So its shadow doesn't fall on the Earth, but rather above or below the Earth. And in that case, we don't have an eclipse. Um, 
we see a total eclipse on the Earth about every 18 months somewhere on the Earth. Mm. And that depends on exactly uh, the orientation, where exactly the moon is um, in this plane as its orbit is sort of tipped by this five degrees. The other thing that happens is that the moon's orbit is not a perfect circle. And so sometimes it's a little further from the Earth and sometimes it's a little closer to the Earth. If it's close, uh, that means that the moon uh, blocks a, a larger part of the sky around the sun. Um, if it's further from the Earth, then it doesn't completely block the sun away. So back in October, we had an, what's called an annular eclipse when the moon was a little too far away and it didn't fully block the sun. But in April, the moon will be closer to the Earth um, and so it will completely block the sun. And because it's pretty close to the Earth at that time, that means that the shadow of the moon on the Earth will be a little bit bigger. And that's why we have such a long period of totality, that four minutes and two seconds, because the Earth and moon's separation is a little bit shorter than it usually is, a little bit smaller. And so we have a wider, re a bigger shadow on the Earth and a little bit longer period of totality. Hmm. Nicely played. <laughs> it's like you do it for a living. I've, Almost, I yeah. feel like I'm right back in class again. <laughs> and uh, I have tried to repeat these words so many times and drawn so many models and used clay and other ways to do it and toothpicks and flashlights and all kinds of stuff. And it's not the same as if you just have it happen to you. Dr. Katie, we have a um, question from Claire in Mrs. Chastine's fifth grade class that goes right with what you were saying. Um, how many total eclipses will a person most likely experience in their lifetime? A person who stays in one place their whole life has a pretty small chance of witnessing an eclipse, or a total eclipse at least. Seeing a partial is pretty common. Every few years we see a partial eclipse. But at any given spot on the Earth, we'll see a total eclipse about once every 375 years. Um, but if you're willing to travel to a place where an, a total eclipse will happen, then you have a pretty good chance of seeing a bunch of them. I've been able to see three in my lifetime. I saw the eclipse in Oregon, Washington, along the Columbia River Gorge in 1979. I saw the total eclipse down in Kentucky in 2017, and I'm really looking forward to the eclipse in 2024, 2024 in Bloomington. Thank you. Wonderful question. I, I encourage everybody to take every possible chance to see this total eclipse because they're so rare. It's so hard to get to one. Um, and if one's coming to you, you really ought to, ought to take a look at that. It's an amazing experience. I have students and they ask great questions and some of them get a little fanciful mm -hmm. because great, qu great <laughs> questions need to be out of this world, right? A different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, some have asked, is, a, is an eclipse a gateway to another dimension? Ooh, wouldn't that be cool? It would be super cool. Super cool. If you're in a science fiction movie, probably. Mm. But in reality, unfortunately not. It is. It's just one of those things that happens, you know? Uh, so it's a strictly physical phenomenon. Strictly physical. Phenomenon. Although many, many cultures have, have established um, stories about eclipses and how they relate to life here on Earth. Those stories are fascinating, and mm. they really reveal a lot about individual cultures. Um, as a scientist, I enjoy hearing about those stories, learning about how ancient peoples, for example, experienced eclipses. Um, it's, it's fascinating to me that even thousands of years ago, human beings were able to predict when eclipses would occur because they follow a pattern. And that pattern happens because of these orientations of orbits, the the inclinations of the planes and the distances of objects between uh, the, where the moon and, and sun and earth are. Uh, those eclipses have been predictable for a long time. It's been hard to predict exactly where those eclipses will occur, but straightforward just to follow the patterns of eclipses um, to predict when they will occur. And humans have been able to do that for a long, long, long time. Um, and it was, oh, I guess just a few hundred years ago that we were able, scientists, astronomers, uh, were, were able to predict where eclipses would fall. Um, but nowadays, we can be incredibly pre precise about when, where those eclipses will be to the second, when they will pass in any given place on the Earth. Um, 
that's that's all mathematics. So people interested in, in eclipses and wanting to calculate this, that math is is what they need to work on. Mm. Math is a really important subject in almost every area of science. So those math problems you do may seem kind of useless, but believe me, comes in handy every day in my work. Absolutely. Uh, one of our guests upcoming uh, is all about, has a lot of information about the cultural uh, references you make about eclipses in the past, um, our culture, and, and moreover, the cultures of the past, uh, the broader world, because our culture, I remember one of my professors saying a few years ago, about 20 years ago, that we're less in touch with our solar system than any other generation has been since the dawn of mankind. Uh, and I think we should take some steps to, to fix that. Yeah, get more aware of what's going on around us. Uh, it's hard to do with all of the artificial lighting. Hmm. That it's very difficult to see the sky at night, particularly if you're in a city. Uh, lights light up the sky in a way that makes it hard to see things. So that's, that's a challenge for people. Plus, we have a busy life indoors. We have a busy life. Um, social lives, we don't get out at night like people used to. So it's something we all miss. Hmm. I see a lot of students who have never seen the Milky Way. It takes a dark sky to see the Milky Way, but it's an absolutely gorgeous sight. I wish everybody could see it. And it's available most nights. It is. That's right. We have another question. Speaking on that topic mm -hmm. of from Rhett in uh, Mrs. Wilcher's pre-K class, so this is a preschool student, um, he asks, since it will be dark, will we be able to see stars during the eclipse? Oh, yes, we will be able to see stars during the eclipse. And not only stars, but the planets will be up. We'll be able to see Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, and Mars in the daytime sky during the total phase of the eclipse. And it's possible we'll also see a comet in the sky up near Jupiter. We don't know yet if that comet will be bright enough to see in the daytime in the sky when when it gets dark during the eclipse, comets are pretty unpredictable. Um, it's going to be on the far side of the sun, and it could be super bright. It should be it could be visible to the naked eye. It certainly will be visible with binoculars during totality. So I'm really excited about the possibility of seeing that comet, and I hope um, I hope everybody has a chance to see it. I hope it's bright enough. Mm. Where will the location of that comet be in the sky? That comet will be above the sun toward Jupiter. So Jupiter will be above, well, above the sun and more toward the south. And the comet will be closer to Jupiter, but sort of in between the sun and Jupiter. So a pair of wide field binoculars uh, should be able to see it, toward even the if south? it's faint. Southeast or southwest? I'm sorry, oh, I'm not so a Jupiter, scientist. Jupiter will be toward the south, uh, the sun will be toward the southwest. Okay. And Jupiter will be more toward the south. Okay. And higher in the sky than the sun. Thank you. So this is from Caroline in Mrs. Williams' second grade class. What do animals do during an eclipse? Oh, Caroline, that's a great question. Mm. So different animals will do different things. Um, some animals will be a little bit nervous because they're not sort of expecting to, for it to get dark that time of day. Animals like birds likely will begin to roost, uh, return to their nests. Uh, if we had crickets out, April 8th is a little bit early for crickets, I think. But they would start some of their nighttime behaviors. They probably will start chirping if we had crickets. April 8th, again, is a little early for that. So different animals will do different things. Some spiders are likely to take down their webs. Some might start building their webs at night, depending on the habits of a particular species of spider. So lots of different things might happen. Um, chickens are likely to go home to their roost, um, start to go to sleep, and then when it gets bright, just four minutes later, they're going to wake up like it's morning and go out and start feeding. The rooster will crow. So if it's cloudy, one of the things that people should do is pay attention to what's happening in nature around them and see how nature, how animals and plants even react to this sudden darkness during the daytime. Excellent question. Kids ask the best questions. Yeah. There's so much to know. Which leads me to another question. Uh, there are so many places to go um, that you can click into 
on your computer and, and, and we'll get you the latest real-time updates and just sign in here and, and just for $2.50, um, all these places that people can get, get drawn into, mm -hmm. clicked into, I guess, or clickbait, I guess. There's probably a word for that. Yeah. But anyway, um, is there a place that you would recommend, like one or two key websites? Yes. Or by name? So first of all, NASA will have a lot of uh, sites set up all along the eclipse path, and we'll be sharing or drawing in sites from all of those locations along the eclipse path and providing them uh, to the public free of charge, absolutely free of charge. Uh, in Bloomington, we will be live streaming the eclipse uh, from Kirkwood Observatory on the Bloomington, on the Indiana University campus in Bloomington, absolutely free of charge. So there will be many sites that will be free, and I would start with NASA uh, because they'll show the entire eclipse, the totality all along the path of the eclipse. But do stop in on the Department of Astronomy website from Bloomington as well. And we'll be happy to share our view of it with you, with all of the viewers from around the state and around the world and around the nation, with what we can see from Bloomington. We'll also be linking two sites all over the country as the eclipse proceeds along the eclipse path as well. There are two apps that I would love to share also uh, with, um, with your listeners. One of them is a simple app called Totality, uh, which is produced by the American Astronomical Society and an organization called Big Kid Science. This is a free app. It's free to download, and it allows uh, people with the app, it works on both Android and iPhone, to identify exactly when the eclipse will happen, wherever they are, and what they'll be able to see. Uh, so that's one tool that I think is really, really helpful. Another tool that's really wonderful is um, called Solar Snap, uh, which allows people to uh, use their cell phones to make multiple uh, pictures and to control the phones to get good uh, uh, exposures of the eclipse um, while it's happening, both both during the partial phases and during the total phases mm. of, the, of the eclipse. And both of those are very, very helpful apps to just download and use, and both of them are free. Very cool. Uh, Solar Snap comes also with a uh, cover, right? With, a big filter with that you filter. over the front of your phone. Yeah. Uh, we've gotten a couple of those for our radios and rockets club to do this astronomy business that we're looking at. Absolutely. Very exciting. We'll be involved with some of that as well. I, you yeah. should. People should know they can also use just basic solar viewers, uh, also oh, on sure. their phones that will protect them. So, but be careful not to burn their phones. Don't just keep pointing it at the sun for a long period of time because it will damage the phone. Uh, what about alternative viewing methods, viewing mechanisms, and tools? Uh, we won't all have uh, ISO-approved eclipse viewing glasses to put on our heads during the eclipse. Uh, so what do we do? Lots and lots and lots of methods to, to see an eclipse. Very simple things. Um, a plain white piece of paper will, with a pinhole in it will produce an image of the sun on the ground below. Easy to see, easy to do. A simple thing like a colander from the kitchen. Take it out, um, and it will produce a whole multitude of little holes. Mm. It has a whole multitude of little holes, and will produce an array of images on the ground. Uh, students interested in an art project can uh, sketch a simple design on a piece of paper and then use a push pin to poke holes to trace out the design, and then that design will be reproduced on the ground below during the partial phases of the eclipse with little crescents of, of uh, what's left of the sun. Uh, a pair of binoculars can be helpful as well. Mm. If you point a pair of binoculars, never look through them at the sun, of course, but pointing a pair of binoculars at the sun and letting the image fall on the ground below uh, will produce a nice image of the sun as well. Uh, so don't leave them around for younger brothers and sisters to play with because they really shouldn't be looking at this. Nobody should look at the sun through binoculars. Uh, but, but they will produce an image that can be used to see the eclipse. Mm. So there are just so many ways. A simple cereal box uh, with a, a pinhole punched in one end and a white card stuck on the bottom can be used uh, in a hole for viewing the, the bottom of the, of the cereal box will produce a simple image of the sun that can be used to see the eclipse as well. There are so many indirect methods of looking at the sun that there's really no reason for anybody to try to do that with a bare eyeball. Mm. 
at the same time, I think it's going to be pretty easy to find a pair of those uh, viewing glasses or a viewer. Uh, check the local library, for example. Uh, they will be or are available, I think, in most libraries around Indiana at this time. Mm -hmm. And get one early so they don't run out. Supplies are limited. Yes. Yes. Which is true. Uh, you've talked about safety tips. And uh, there are many, uh, like there's insider information. I don't know if there's, if, is there anything that you would do? Mm, I don't know if I should say it like that. Maybe we should skip this part. Uh, are there any insider trading information kind of ideas? Any things that people... Shh, nope. Forget this. We're moving on. No, I, I can provide a tip that is okay. something people should hear, I think. Uh, we have here in Indiana about a 40% chance of clear weather. That means we have about a 60% chance of not clear mm. weather. And that means we might not be able to see the eclipse on Eclipse Day. It will still get dark, for sure. Uh, but I think if I could choose anywhere I wanted to be in Indiana at that time, I would put myself at a place where I could see the horizon to the southwest and the horizon to the northeast. And I would want to watch that darkness approaching from the southwest and receding to the northeast after the eclipse. So the top of a hill or someplace where you have a good view of the horizon would be, I think, the tip I would share with people, particularly in case of cloudy weather. Mm. Uh, it is only, what's well, about a 60-mile radius circle. Mm -hmm. Ellipse, right? Ellipsoid circle, mm -hmm. depending on where you see it. Mm -hmm. uh, getting longer and longer as it leaves Indiana, it's going to be stretching out more and more. Yep. Uh, and then it's traveling about... What is it, a thousand miles? About a thousand hour? miles an hour. So you can get a sense of 120 miles is the width of that circle as it first gets dark here. And four minutes later, the sun has traveled 120 miles at a thousand miles an hour. It's a, some distance. That's, that's something. Right. <laughs> it's moving right along. That's faster than the speed of sound. But we're talking about light here. We're talking about light. That's so. Right. And we're talking about the speed of the moon and the speed of the earth in their orbits around the. And the rotation of the Earth. It's like a scene. All of those things together. Like a scene from uh, uh, in an Indiana Jones movie or some mm -hmm. such, with all these all these alignments. Lots happen. of moving parts. National yep. treasure. All those those amazing dramatic moments when the sun is blocked out. Yeah, uh, it it's all pretty comes epic. together just those four minutes. <laughs> it is pretty epic. All right, so we've talked about uh, the mechanics, mm -hmm. uh, the what. Um, We've talked about safety, so that's kind of like, well, now what? Or, or you yeah, know, like, now what do we do? How do we deal with that? Uh, there's also the idea that um, eclipses don't happen very often. Yeah? And uh, you've seen three. Three. And those were totality. Mm hmm So that's like 12 minutes. I don't even count the, the partials. I've seen partials <laughs> too, but, you know, it's just a partial. <laughs> It's just a partial eclipse, and I appreciate that. And, and uh, But those of us who've only ever seen partial eclipses, they're pretty cool. They are pretty cool, I agree. But totality. <laughs> is a whole different thing. Mm. It makes you want to take the flight to the second one. Yep. So how far do people go? Like, to what lengths do people go to come and be in this place that we just happen to be in? Like, we're just here. Some people will come thousands of miles to witness an eclipse. So uh, there are cruise ships that sail to places in the South Pacific where eclipses take place. And people spend thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, to be on those cruise ships. Or they travel to Australia or the ends of the earth in order to witness total eclipses. Mm. There are people who've seen a dozen or more total eclipses. It's so compelling that they just want to see more. We are in just incredibly lucky that there's one coming right here where we live. So it's, an, it's a super exciting time, and we will see lots and lots and lots of people coming to Indiana. Uh, we have a 40% chance of clear weather. Further to the southwest in Texas, mm. they have a, a higher percentage of clear weather. So many more people will be going to uh, southwestern Texas to see the eclipse down mm. there. 
uh, it, just because they have a better chance of, of clear weather. But we will still see a lot of people who don't have time or the funding to make a long trip somewhere far away. We'll see people driving from all over Indiana, from Kentucky, um, from Ohio, just Illinois, all over, coming into Indiana to be in the path of totality, uh, to witness this amazing event. Mm. I'm hoping to have my brother and my kids come mm -hmm. so we can be in the yard together and experience literally a once-in-a-lifetime event. It is for us a once-in-a-lifetime event. The last eclipse in, in this part of Indiana, southern Indiana, was in 1869. The last eclipse in northern Indiana was in 1205. So they just don't happen that often. Wow. Like you said, on, on average, 375, 375 years. 75 years. But it's a big planet. Some places are more average than others. And the shadow isn't that big. <laughs> it's, it's, it's small. So. It is strikingly small. I saw a picture, a little bit of a video clip from the International Space Station showing the dark spot traversing the earth. And it was remarkable. It was remarkable. And they were moved by it, but it wasn't the same as if they were on the receiving end. That's right. Yeah. Mm. It's a very different thing. Yeah, so I'm excited. I'm stoked. <laughs> uh, thank you. And we have one last question. I feel I'm a little sad because it's just one last mm -hmm. question, one last bit of our chat. Uh, so it's been a pleasure. It has been. Thank you for joining us, joining me, joining us here uh, <clears throat> at NLCS here at BNL in our amazing studio, right? This is a wonderful studio, yes. I can't get over it. It's, <laughs> I'm thrilled that we've invested this much uh, time, effort, and space into uh, kids reaching out to other people and talking communication, right? Communicating what they know and what they want to know to other people. That's the secret of science, I guess. If you don't, oh, but yeah. someone someone once said, if you don't, if you don't know how to write or you can't write, and what's the, what's the point of doing the science? You can't tell anybody about what you've done. You know? uh, so, learn those skills. Skills are critical. Yeah. Um, the last question: um, How do you think we can help more people enjoy a love of science? It's just about sharing. I think people are curious. People are interested in learning things. Um, I, sometimes as we get older, we reach a point where it's, it gets harder to learn things, particularly in, in modern society when we're learning so much so fast as a society, as a mm. culture, that it, it's hard to keep up with everything and people have to sort of put up a little bit of a barrier just to get through the day. But finding something that's intriguing, that's interesting, that you want to know, uh, I think it helps keep us all young and vigorous and active and open in our thinking. Um, I think it keeps us younger to have that curiosity. Uh, and so holding on to that, even as we get older, I think is really important for people. Keeping the curiosity. Keeping the curiosity. And sharing. And sharing. Well, thank you so, so very much. It's been a pleasure. Um, we're having passionate conversations about eclipses and I can, I can feel that. Uh, it's a phenomenal phenomenon. And I think that uh, if, if you haven't noticed, <laughs> we have that bug. <laughs> you just start to talk about it and we get all going. And I'm very excited about that. And I cannot wait for the morning of April 8th and seeing what it's going to bring to us. Cloudy or crystal clear sky. There'll be a gazillion people here wanting to park in my grass, and mm -hmm. it's going to be an amazing experience. It is, a experience of a lifetime. Mm. So thank you so very much for sharing your incredible lifetime of insights, Katie. Uh, and thanks for being a great professor. I have fun every day. Mm. Changed my life. <laughs> Amen. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Be well. Mm -hmm.